All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lesson 15, where we are going to be talking about the tools of the trade, which is a bit of a misnomer, because what you'll learn in this lesson is that you're going to learn how to use the only free tool that you'll need to use when working with databases and SQL. There's really just one tool that I use, and I will pass on that knowledge to you, and, uh, and obviously how to install this tool on your computer. So that tool is called Toad for MySQL. Now, there are obviously many different tools for managing your databases. You can pick whichever one you like. But I've always used Toad for MySQL, and it's always worked for me. And really, the great thing about this Toad for MySQL is that it supports all the major relational database management system providers, including Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, IBM's DB2, as well as, obviously, MySQL. So that's helpful because if you ever change your relational database management providers, you'll have a consistent interface. So I used Toad when I worked at my previous job when they used Microsoft SQL Server. That was just the tool that we ended up using. As well as the job previous to that, we used Oracle. And at that job, they used Toad as well. So it was kind of uh, set in stone as sort of an industry standard, at least as far as I was concerned, with respect to the sort of quote-unquote IDE that you use when dealing with databases and SQL. So I naturally, of course, got very comfortable with it, and I ended up using it in my own endeavors. And now I will pass on that knowledge to you. Now, a big plus with the Toad for MySQL is that obviously it's widely used and therefore it's widely supported in the community, which is a huge plus. So if you have any problems, you can Google it and I guarantee you someone somewhere in the internet will have uh, a solution for you. So that's really great. Oh, and I say it's also free too. Obviously, you can't beat that, right? Free is always a good thing. So really, that's that's all there is to, to talk about. The rest is just to actually show you how to actually install Toad, as well as sort of the, uh, the little ways that I go about using it and the sort of tips and tricks that go along with using Toad to make our lives just that much easier. But I, I have a little note here. I have an addendum that says you don't have to use this Toad app if you if you don't want to. If you're more comfortable using another app that you've already been using your whole life, then by all means, use that one. You do not need to use Toad. I'm just using it because I've always used it. And if you really wanted to, heck, you can even use the command prompt or terminal if you like. If that makes you feel like a bad coder or whatever, if you just love to use the terminal type windows, then by all means, use terminal or command prompts if you like. It might make you look cooler in the eyes of those around you and that might be very important to you. So then by all means, do it. So yeah, there you go. There you have it. I'm going to show you how to use Toad and how to install it. So let's get rolling on that right now. All right. So as you can see here, I've done the search for Toad for MySQL and I'm just going to go to the first hit in these Google results here, which is from quest.com. Quest is the maker of the Toad application suite because they've got a whole bunch of them. It was actually acquired by Dell Software. So if you see Dell, don't don't get too worried. That's exactly what you want. So what they have here is they have a free trial that you can download. Again, this is a free program, but it, they do have a paid version as well. I mean, it's been a while since I've downloaded it, but I'm going to go ahead and download this one. I'm assuming they're going to try to upgrade you to the paid version, but I guarantee you that the free version is probably all you're ever going to need. It's all I ever needed, so I can't see you needing anything more than just the free version. So I'm going to download the free trial, and like I said, it probably asked me to try to uh, upgrade, but I'll just ignore the request for upgrade. That's, I guess, the price you pay for free. And I'm going to go ahead and populate all these forms with, with my information. And of course, Dell is asking me for a little a survey, but I'm obviously going to ignore that for now. And you see here that you have the actual installation file. So I'm going to download the Toad for MySQL, which is the freeware, and uh, it'll go ahead and download that to my PC. And then when it's done downloading, I will obviously run it and bring you through the steps for installing it on your computer. Now, for those of you with a Mac, I'm, I'm assuming they have a Mac version. I should probably double check that right now. Let me see my uh, SQL Toad for MySQL Mac. Let me just make sure they do have a Mac version so I'm not eliminating you guys. Okay, so it looks like Toad does have a Mac edition. It looks like it's coming from Toad World. Let me see Toad edition from Dell software. Uh, let's see if we can get it through Dell. Okay, so it looks like you can get the Toad Mac edition, which is database management for Mac users. Okay, so that looks correct. And Toad for MySQL related products. Okay, so it looks like there is definitely some sort of Mac OS X version that you can download. So that's good. I didn't want to leave you guys out from the picture here. Okay, so now uh, it looks like it's done downloading. It's saying that it's uh, potentially malicious code, but I guarantee you it's not malicious code. It's coming from a very trusted source. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that to go ahead and run it. 
All right, so now I've gone and I've actually executed the, or run the executable file here. Again, if you're on a PC, you'll have an executable file. If you're on a Mac, you will have a different type of file. I think it's, uh, is that a DMG file or something like that? Uh, you can, most likely you can run that and you can install the program and you'll be able to click and drag it in your applications folder inside of your Finder app. I'm not a Mac professional. Hopefully you guys understand how to install software because yes, I'm not a professional. As for the PC, I'm definitely professional there. So uh, you get an executable file. And uh, for some reason in this instance, Chrome flagged this as uh, suspicious software. Maybe this is a new part of Chrome's functionality that I'm not aware of because I've never seen it do that before. And I actually had to rename the download to be to forcefully rename it from an unconfirmed or dot unconfirmed or something file name to a dot exe. You probably won't have to deal with that, but just in case you do, for the purposes of being complete here, all you need to do is rename that file to a .exe and you can run it. I went and scanned it with my own virus software just to confirm that it's okay, and sure enough, it found nothing, so I'm very comfortable with the Toad software. Like I said, I've been using it for years and years and years, and it's from Dell, so I trust it, so no worries. Okay. So I've gone ahead and run it, and it says it's strongly recommended that you close all the programs and whatnot. Um, I've got plenty open right now, but I'm going to, of course, ignore those warnings and just keep going uh, with the installation. So, license agreement, I will say next. I'm sure you guys have gone through this many, many times before. Um, I'm going to go ahead and type in my full name. Okie dokie. So, I will say anyone who uses a computer can use it. I will say next. It will choose the folder to install to. I say next. And then it says, which file extensions would you like to associate with Toad? That's fine by me. I let it do its default stuff. And I, I just, like I said, leave it completely by the default. I sometimes I like to open .sql files with my notepad just because it's quicker than having to open up Toad. So I don't check that. If you want to be able to open up your SQL files right directly into Toad, then by all means, you can check this box. But like I said, I prefer using notepad just because it's much quicker to launch. And hopefully that should be more or less the end of this process. It's pretty quick to uh, install an application. And then we should be able to launch it and I should be able to show you exactly how to use the program. So let me just skip forward until this installation is done and we can get going. Alrighty, so it's done installing. And uh, one thing I will warn you of is that when you actually launch the program, it has a little sound bite of a frog ribbiting or whatever the, the word is. So don't be scared. Don't have your speakers turned up to maximum volume because that can scare you a little bit. And in any case, it's loaded up and now it's saying, you know, how would you like to lay everything out? How would you like the, the actual application to look? I usually just select Toad for SQL Server DB2 in my SQL and say finish. And, uh, and we should be ready to rock now with our Toad for MySQL. So this is the actual application itself and what you essentially the way we use this is sort of the same way we'd use the command prompt. So in the command prompt what we do is we tell our program how to connect to our database. Okay, so we have to type in, you know, MySQL, and then you type in hyphen U and specify a username and then specify a password and all that stuff. We have to follow the same rules for this Toad program. So in order to do that, you need to say file, new, and connection, because we're, we're telling it how to connect to our database. Okay, so that opens up a, a new connection window. And now what you can do is you should be able to just leave everything as it is. Your host name should still be localhost unless you installed it differently during the process of installing your RDBMS. And uh, the port again should be the same unless you changed it during the configuration when you installed your RDBMS initially. Your username is usually the, just you can put in root as the username, but uh, it really depends on what uh, you chose in, in the actual installation process. I will type in my password that I chose, and then I can uh, tell it to connect to a database, a database if I like, which I believe was my test DB if, if memory serves. So we'll see if that works. And you see down here, it kind of gives you the name for uh, this particular connection information. You can save it so that you will uh, always it available to connect to, or you can say save password and connect on startup. It depends on how you what like to do it. I'm just going to say save password and connect on startup so that I don't have to type this stuff in every single time I start up this application. And I'll go ahead and say connect. Okay, so if all goes well, it should connect properly. And it looks like it has. So now if I sort of just, I'm going to modify the view screen a little bit here and move this up. Now you see it has actually connected to the My Test DB uh, application. I have a bunch of databases on my computer, but it has connected to My Test DB. And you have a peek at the actual tables inside of that particular database, which in this one, I just have one table, which is the user's table. And it gives me some information down here regarding the columns inside of that table. 
Okay. If I had more tables, I'd be able to click on other ones and then see a breakdown of the table itself as to what columns it has and where the keys are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for now, what I want to do is I want to be able to actually interact with my database and actually type in some SQL code. So how do I do that? Well, I say File, New, and I say Editor. Editor is where you are able to actually type in SQL commands. Now, the one thing that is a bit tricky is that there's two ways to connect to databases. So when I type stuff in here, like if I want to say select star from uh, users, okay, I can run this command, but it's going to be run on this database, which is fine. This is my test DB. But if I were to select another database, like my address book database, I'm now doing a select star from users on the address book database, but I'm peeking at the information inside of a different database. This is my test DB. So just because you have my test DB selected here does not mean that that is the database you're going to be running commands on. The database you're running commands on is in the top left hand corner. So if I need to go and switch it to my test DB and then I can actually run this command by hitting the execute script button here and then it'll actually properly run and get the results down here. Now I've cleared out my database. I used to have a couple of rows in there but I actually deleted them so there's nothing in there at the moment. But we can actually populate it fairly quickly. So to populate it quickly, what you can do is you can actually right click on the table itself. You can say right click on the users table and you can go down to generate SQL and you can actually choose which statement of code you want to generate. So I want to insert data into this table. So I'll say generate SQL insert statement and I will just directly do it to the editor. And there you go. It has populated an insert statement for me. So it actually says insert into and here it uses a slightly different syntax than we're used to but here it actually specifies the database name first and then the table name. So this means that if we were pointed to a different database, like let's say let's switch over to the address book database, if I were to run this, it would still insert it into the proper database because we specified the database name first. Okay, that's sort of a special syntax. If I were to delete this and just say insert into users, then it would try to insert into the users table inside of the address book database. You see how that works, but I don't want to insert an address book. I want to insert into my test DB. Now I'm in a situation where if I run this statement, it'll insert into my test DB because this is always a database that we're working with in the top corner. Very, very important to remember that if you have multiple databases. In any case, it has quickly generated this code for us, and now we can actually go and put in the, the fields that we like. So I'll put in one for the user ID. I'll put in, I don't know, T page for the username, uh, password one, two, three, and an email address of Trevor at Java video tutorials.net. And then I can select everything and run it in the top left hand corner by clicking execute script, or I can hit the F5 key. That works well on uh, PCs. I'm not exactly sure what the shortcut key is for Mac, but it, I'll just click on the button now to be ubiquitous between the two platforms. So now in the bottom, I get an outputted statement that says that one row has been affected, which means that I have successfully inserted into the database. Now I can just change things, change them to someone else like JDo. I can do password exclamation mark and do JDo at, well, Java Video Tutorials, tutorials.net. How about that? And insert. And there you go. And then I can just delete all this code and say select star from users and run that code. And there we go. Now we have our two rows populated appropriately inside of the database. So this is why Toad is so useful. It'll, you can you know generate code. If you don't remember how to do an insert statement, you can right click and say generate SQL. And you can even do delete statements, update, insert, and select statements. Very, very handy for, like I said, if you don't know them off the top of your head. You can even do creation scripts. Although, let me show you how to do it. You can create a table as well. Instead of doing it through a script, you can do it through a nice actual GUI, like an actual graphical user interface. So you can say create table, and then it gives you this little box here where you can actually type in the name of a table. So if you don't want to, if you don't remember how to create tables, a syntax for it, you can use this, this editor. So you can say, let's say users address table, and you can tell it what database it should be created in. You can specify a primary key, although right now if I click on this, these, sorry, I did that too quickly. If I quick click on these little buttons here, you should have a list of columns to select from, but we don't haven't, we haven't created any columns in here yet. So let's create some columns. So I, by doing that, I go to the next tab. So I have general and I can go to columns and here we can create the actual column. So I'm going to go into the name, say address ID, and we'll make this sure we'll make this an int and we'll make it not nullable because we'd never want our primary key to be null. I'll add a new field by clicking the add button and I can say, oh, let's see, street address. And I can change this from an int to probably a varchar. 
I can even, let me just type in varchar, there we go. And you can actually type in the length of the varchar. So usually street addresses can get pretty long. So let's make it 80 characters. And uh, let's see, do I want to make it not null? You know, you can make it not null if you like. It really depends on how you want your tables to be created. But we're just kind of playing around right now. So I'm not going to make it too, you know, picture perfect. So let's do street, city, make that a varchar. Let's do, I don't know, 50 for that one. I'm just, you know, spitballing here. City, region, make it a varchar and change it to 50 as well. Uh, city, region, region code, kind of like a zip code. Char, let's make this one, I don't know, 10. And country, and also a var char. And we'll make that one 50. Okay, so now I can go back up to the general tab. Okay, because we're just in columns, I'm gonna go up to general. And now I can change the primary key to being whatever it is that's available. So now you have this list that is populated that you can select from. So I'll select address ID and say OK. So now it's going to assign address ID as the primary key. You can even go so far as to add other keys. Like let's say we want this to be a one-to-many relationship between users and addresses. So I'll populate a user ID, make it an int, make it not nullable. And I think, is it in here that I can do this? No, I can go back to general. Was it general? I forget now, I haven't used this in so long. Oh, it's constraints, there we go. I can go to constraints and I can add a foreign key. Okay, so again, if you don't remember how to add foreign keys, uh, you can go to constraints, you can say add, and you can name it. So let's call this the, oh, I don't know, uh, user address FK for foreign key. I can select the source column, which is user ID and destination table so this is referring to the users table and the user id see how it just automatically knows how to populate it and everything for you so there we go we've created a foreign key which we've added a name to you haven't seen that before but you can actually name what are called constraints which is foreign key a foreign key is a type of constraint okay so you can almost think of constraint as like an object level thing if you have any experience with java or object oriented programming languages it's a very generic catch-all type property it's a constraint so a foreign key is a type of constraint so you can name your constraint whatever you like so there you go i've added a name and then finally you can go down to sql script and you can see this is the actual code that it has created the actual sql script that it has created that will actually carry out your commands okay so all of that work that we had just done ends in this it, it just creates this script. If you were to just take this, copy it, and close this whole window, and then paste it into our editor back here, it would do the exact same thing. That's all it's doing is running this code. So the whole point of this entire endeavor was to create this script. So you can see it cr creates a table. It's using this syntax again where it's using it's specifying the database name. But again, you don't have to specify the database name if you don't want to, so long as you have the right database selected in the top left. And then it's creating the actual column. So we see address ID and so on and so forth. And then the user ID and you see it adds a constraint, foreign key, and it has all of this syntax for properly assigning the foreign key. All right. And, uh, and that's the beauty of th this Toad software is that it does it all for you. You can say, okay, it says table created successfully. And now we have a, an address table that has all of the appropriate columns created as well as the foreign key assigned, which establishes the relationship between the users table and the address table. We'll get into more of the syntax on constraints in a, in a few episodes later, a few lessons later. Um, I don't want you to get bogged down with it right now because there's a lot to learn, but we will be getting there. So there you go. That's Toad for you. Hopefully whatever program you are using, if you don't use Toad, has that sort of functionality. If it doesn't, then maybe you should consider using Toad because like I said, it's quite powerful. It's uh, very useful and I have used it for many, many years uh, and it has never failed me. So Excellent. Thanks so much for watching this video. This one was a bit longer than I intended, but I wanted to be very thorough with my explanation of how to install this program and how to use it appropriately. So I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson and bye for now.